You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at mixler.com slash options dash insider. Insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com. The Options Insider Radio Network is sponsored by Fidelity Investments. At Fidelity, you'll always get a great value for your options trades. And with powerful investing tools that provide clear next steps, plus independent research and a wide range of investment types, we can help you make better trading decisions. Learn more about options trading with Fidelity at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block. With your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody, that rockin' tune means it's time to rock out with the option block, your favorite, I hope at least it's your favorite, bi-weekly source for all things options-related. Let's get right into the business at hand here. Joining me to talk about all things options, let's, let's just spin the wheel, see who we got. Here we are, first off, way out in the hinterlands of Chicago, a little, a little sleepy hamlet we call St. Charles where we are joined by none other than Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management. Welcome back. Welcome back to the show. What are the odds you'd be joining us from St. Charles Wealth Management in St. Charles? Amazing. A million to one. Doing well. Doing well. We actually have a little bit of rain today, but uh, aside from that, uh, all... That's what happens when you turn off the weather shield every now and then. You get actual weather, which is, uh, which is crazy out there in the provincial hamlet. And also joining us, I'm not sure where he is. He could be down the. What was that, Mike? We we like to live like the rest of the world at times. <laughs> yes, sometimes. Every once in a while, you got to slum it like the rest of us and have some actual weather. And then again, joining us from who knows? Could be out in the town that changed America, or could be right down the street, or could be who knows where. It is the Greasy Meatball, Mr. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com by way of Garmin Line Capital. Mr. Meatball, welcome back to the program to you as well. Hey, good to be here. I'm uh, happy to be around and happy to see y'all. Are you are you joining us from the World HQ? Or are you joining us from Riverside, Illinois? Where are you beaming in from? I'm from I'm coming to you live from uh, from the HQ, it uh, in beautiful downtown Chicago on LaSalle Street. Beautiful downtown Chicago, and in that, it's raining and gross. <laughs> oh, no rain in July. There are J- July rain in January. There are worse things in Chicago than it's a little bit of rain in January, and there are worse things on the trading block. So let's get to it. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody, welcome to The Trading Block, the portion of the show where we break down what the heck is trading, what is lighting up the old collective tape. And apparently, if you didn't get the memo, all is right with the world again. Uh, All the major indices up, up pretty firmly, not quite the 
explosion to the upside that we've seen in recent weeks, but still pretty firm to the upside. Uh, S&P up about right around one and a quarter percent, a little bit shy of that. NASDAQ up about 1.6 percent. And the Dow, just the laggard, up a mere almost one percent, not quite one percent. Uh, even seeing gold get a little bit of a lift up a quarter of a percent, a little over three handles. And oil, crude oil, threatening a uh, WTI, threatening the 50 handle, right, 49 and a quarter out there right now. So it's kind of uh, kind of kind of green all over the place, except for our old friend, Ye old VIX Cash, which is a relaxing to the downside, off a slight tenth of a handle or so, right around 21 and a quarter right now. Got as high today as looks like about about a point and a half higher, about 22.71 earlier in the, in the session, and then a kind of just a tapering off ever since as the markets feel feel the upward magic. Also seeing some of the some of the names you guys like to trade. Uh, making some news here today. We got good old Tesla up. Oh, a whopping 18 handles or about almost 6% on news. Apparently, they broke ground on their Shanghai Gigafactory outside outside of Shanghai. So that's enough to send the stock moving. As you might imagine, we've got a Pivotal Research Group initiating coverage of Amazon with a buy rating. Go figure. Uh, they're putting a price target of 1920, which right now is at about 1620. So 300 handles. To the north, that's enough to bump the stock up about 3% over there as well. And Apple kind of uh, unched, despite the fact that it's uh, striking a deal with uh, Samsung. So you can get some of their iTunes stuff on their Samsung TV. So Apple and Samsung I haven't always seen eye to eye, but apparently making nice there. All right, let's go around the horn and see what's uh, what's kicking things off. Let's, what's, what's on their collective tapes Let's go back the other way. Let's go back uh, to the meatball first. Mr. Meatball, what's catching your eye? And did you get the memo that all is right with the world again, sir? Yeah, kind of some some crazy uh, crazy rally going again. We have we go 85 bucks yesterday and another $31 so far today in the S&P. Uh, the Dow's a little weaker, but really it is green across the board. Uh, Apple about the only stock that's not just gone straight up. Um, I'm not seeing much red anywhere. And this market looks like, uh, at least for the time being, it's it's uh, a little more relaxed. Yeah, a little bit more relaxed than you know the the multiple percent upside days we've seen in uh, in uh, recent weeks. Mister Uncle Mike, uh, are you? Did you get the memo that all is indeed right with the world? And are you uh, all in? Are you? I know you're waiting for the bit of positivity before you really kind of uh, dove in with both feet. Is this the moment, or is is is, are you still thinking this is the market for crazy people? Uh, I think it's a, moment, a market for slightly less crazy people at this stage. But I'm uh, kind of like a Teddy Roosevelt, walk strong but carry a big, uh, walk softly but carry a big stick type of a, of a thought on this. Uh, in looking at this, I think that what I'm looking to do this week uh, is gradually kind of scale into this market and the aggressive strategies with which I'm doing. Uh, but if we do go negative on the year, I will plan on scaling out rather quickly uh i'm not looking to just go all in right now by any means but i think uh, this is a huge opportunity to scale in uh with the fact that we have uh, s&p down six percent from last year if you feel you missed anything last year now is a phenomenal opportunity to get into things but once again i want to emphasize size scaling in and one thing that has been key throughout history is if the market's higher or the market's lower if the market's lower on the year uh then i uh, think you're not going to make money if you're a bull and vice versa of course unless you get in at specific times so what i'm looking at right now i think now is a good time to start dipping the toe in the water uh at least that's what i'm going to be doing this week on the aggressive strategies and let's see what's lighting it up collectively out there on the old options tape. Let's look at equities, op- options first. Uh, Apple, despite the fact that it's pretty much unched off like a quarter or so, it's still leading the tape, about 355,000 contracts on the tape. Number two, GE, about 273,000. Number three, AMD, a little bit shy of a quarter million. Then we drop off a bit to number four, Netflix, a buck 77. Micron, number five, 140,000. Then we got to NVIDIA. 
Telephone, the old telephone, the other T name that was big back in the day. Uh, Tesla, Amazon, and Bank of America round out the top 10 with about 119,000 there. On the bottom, in terms of other products, indices, and whatnot, coming into Showtime, this is about, this data maybe is about a half an hour old or so. VIX had about 318,000, so actually decent paper for VIX uh, on the day. About one and a quarter million contracts in SPY, a little over half a, half a million in SPX, and about 275,000 out there in the queues, which averaged somewhere around a million a day out there in Q's land. Since we're talking numbers, gents, I've been crunching the numbers. It's, it's the end of the year, beginning of a new year, so we always look back on things that were exciting, things that were popular, things that were interesting. We also crunched the numbers on this show and looking at what, uh, what was popular for our audience of this program over last year. We have, we have the numbers. Uh, would you guys like to hear what, uh, what the most popular items, most popular shows of the option block were from last year? Absolutely. Yes. I've been dying to hear about the I know you have. The I know most, you, ob, you, most uh you've been hitting me up every day about. since since and New I'm Year's. Gonna, I gotta say one thing before you start. If these aren't all with me on the show, then I'm gonna be disappointed. You may be in for a little disappointment here, sir. Let's uh number ten. It's 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 kind of difficult to calculate the option block because it's on lives in a couple of places. Uh, m- primarily our main network fee, which m- the bulk of our audience comes to, but not all of it by any means. And then also has its own independent fee, which goes out to a bunch of different places too. And they actually had different types, so we're gonna we're gonna read them off together, even though. And number ten for both is the same. We're going from the bottom to the top. Number ten episode of the option block for seven nineteen. This one will make you sad. Uh, Mark, because it's uh, the Rock Lobster. His name's even in the title. It's, it was option block 719 from, ep- from June 1st of last year. It was the Rock Lobster Loves Asian Options. I remember that episode because we had a listener write in about Asian options and what they were like and how they were priced. And Andrew wanted nothing to do with it. So it was, uh, <laughs> it was a fun one for all involved. And uh, that, was, uh, that was up there on number 10 on both of our lists here. Number 9... Uh, let's just keep it to uh, one list because they're pretty much they're pretty much the same. Let's go to well, let me look at the main network one because that's what has the the bulk of the listeners. Number nine is episode seven sixteen secret that options muggles don't know. That's from May eighteenth of last year. Number eight, number seven, episode seven thirty VIX versus the negative zone. That's where we were talking from July thirteenth of this year. That's where we were talking about uh, the that's. One of the many times that I gave the Rock Lobster some crap about his Vic zones and perhaps his, shall we say, less than creative naming therein. And so, <laughs> so one of the times uh, we talked about that. Option block 736, new bat time, same bat channel from August 10th. That's when we switched the show. As you remember, listeners used to do it at 3 p.m. Central. Uh, started kicking it off at noon there. Clearly you guys like the new time because that episode coming in at number seven on our top ten here, list for the year, number six, option block 733. You guys always love the earnings shows, and this is one of those. Uh, this is from July, so July 27th, the earnings palooza. We talked Facebook, Amazon, Intel, Chipotle, and more, and you guys you guys loved all that. Numbers five, option block 718. Uh, we did some crazy Tesla, Deutsche Bank, and HMNY options trades. We broke them down in the odd block on that show. You guys like that one on May 25th. Number four, our option block 749, the birthday strategy and question palooza, October 5th. Which of you gentlemen's birthday was that? I don't recall. Is that your Not birthday, mine. Uncle Mike? It's October 4th, so that makes me think it's that, mine. That would probably be the Uncle Mike birthday palooza then. There we go. Yeah, Uncle Mike. Oh, that's right. You did your birthday strategy block. That's right. Where you talked about how to count how many candles to put on your cake. Uh, so there you go. The audience liking your birthday palooza, Uncle Mike. Number four. Uh, number three. <laughs> This goes back to October 26th. <coughs> Excuse me. This is, you know, coming on off the heels a week or two after just the crazy sell-offs. October 11th, of course, being the busiest options day of the year last year. That's when the, the worm kind of turned on the broad equity market. So here we are a couple of weeks after that. The episode was entitled, What the Heck is Going On? I think a lot of you guys had a lot of those questions. We had those questions, too. That was from the uh, option, that was episode 754 from October 26th. Number two. So the penultimate episode, in terms of interest at least, uh, was episode 725 from June 22nd, where we talked about well-timed puts and funky verticals. You guys like all that stuff. And our number one episode of Option Block for last year, because Option Block 747 from September 28th of, of last year. So interesting timing, kind of 
in the lead up to that sell off, but it hadn't really happened yet. So we were still kind of in firmly, mostly bull territory. VIX wasn't exactly lighting it up. Volume wasn't lighting it up. So kind of interesting that that period would be the one. It wasn't February. It wasn't late October. It was late September, actually. And it was in search of the steepest skew where we kind of compared and contrast a lot of different skews across a variety of different products. So that, that kind of surprised me. That surprised you guys that that was, uh, that's, that's the, hot, uh, the hot business on the show this past year? They wanted well, a, I would have guessed that some of the shows uh, when I would have guessed when uh, X, the day after or the day that XIV uh, went under. That would have been my guess for number one. Yeah, you think February would have ranked higher, but I'm looking. Yeah, at, you would have thought this data goes down to number thirteen here, and I see some stuff for November. Uh, something for January. Our big wrap up of 2017 episode was number twelve. Uh, number 11 was uh, was that. Yeah, I don't see. It's funny. I don't see any February here in like the top uh, 13. I go down a little farther. So that that's that surprised me. Uh, do you want to do uh, if you like, I can do a quick runoff of the top overall shows on our network for last year. You want me to hit that really quickly? For sure. From the resounding. Yes, I'll guess the answer is yes. I'll hit those really quickly here as well. We'll put out stuff on the network and on the website and, of course, on social media so you guys can find all those ep- episodes as well. Uh, the number 10 over us is all of our shows now. So this is everything we do. Daily news, TWIFO, volatility views, advisors option, all that stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me, interview show. Uh, boot camp as well, surprisingly. Uh, number 10, uh, what the heck is going on? Episode option block 754, that one I mentioned before from October 26, coming in at number 10 on our overall network list as well. Uh, number nine, option block 725. So well-timed puts and funky verticals from June 22nd. So the bottom half here, a whole option block palooza. Uh, number eight, it was the search of steepest skew. That one we talked about from the top of the list from October, September 28th. Number seven on our overall network was Twifo number 117. That was a deep dive into equity volume and volatility from September 7th of last year. Uh, number six was the interview I did with our old pal, Mr. Sazanoff there from Tasty Trade, when he, they won our, uh, our Broker's Madness competition. That was from late April of last year. Number five is Twifo 116 Metals, Energy, and Hedging Equities with Treasury Options from August 24th of last year. Number four, good old boot camp. Uh, boot camp. You guys, you guys love yourself some boot camp. <laughs> the show was on hiatus all of last year. We only did two new episodes, and yet you guys continue to devour that show. Boot camp number uh, four, options boot camp 72, busting options expiration miss. Actually came out in December of 2017, but we included it on this list because it had a furious amount of downloads in 2018 as well. Number three is actually an option block from uh, 2017 as well but we also included it because you guys loved it it was our bitcoin battles and long options debate episode from december 5th of 2017 so actually ironically our biggest show of the year last year was actually a show we did at the end of 2017 but you guys continued to love it all year long i guess part of that is because of the bitcoin in there and that was of course the bitcoin frenzy uh number two and number one are both kind of we're both kind of surprises to me but it shows your guys love of this program options boot camp 73 options for veterans we did that one back with uh, the trade station folks back in and nasdaq back in february 1st i mean boot camp was on hiatus last year we, we didn't we only did two episodes and you guys still devoured over a quarter of a million hours of that show. You guys love that show. So we message heard loud and clear. We're going to do more of those coming up starting this week. We're going to start doing more boot camps. And number one show of the whole network last year was Options Boot Camp 74, trading options in a high volatility environment from May 30th of last year. So you guys love it. You have spoken loudly and clearly. Don't worry. We'll get more, uh, more boot camps on the air for you guys. Speaking of which, we've got to keep rolling. It is time to keep on rolling into the old odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, everybody, welcome to The Odd Block portion of the show where we get weird, we get wild, we get wondrous, <laughs> we get all sorts of, of W-themed things here. Well, let's kick things off. I'm actually going to look back a little bit on our one here. We're going to look back at some activity we've highlighted uh, earlier on the program and actually late last year, starting off with some call activity 
in Dan, AKA, AKA Dana Inc, ticker symbol Dan, D-A-N, that we talked about first on the show back on November 8th of last year. At the time, he profiled the Dan March 15 calls going up through the offer, above the offer, actually. They were offered at a buck 65. They went up late printing for a buck 75, about 5,000 times. Uh, and that was on the 8th. Also worth noting, a little bit more traded on the 9th, but not a ton. Uh, we also saw some going up on uh, the 7th as well, about 4,000 of those going up on the 7th as well. So 4,000 trading on the 7th, 5,000 trading when we first saw it on the 8th. So collectively, they cre- increased that OI to about 9,000. Uh, over time, we saw a bunch uh, going up. And this stock has uh, this trade. Looks like, let's see, let's go pull up a, a chart here. The Dan stock at the time today, it is 15 and a quarter. So those calls clearly in the money. The stock's up about half a percent, half a buck, I should say, or about almost 3%. Uh, but this name since, let's see, went up on the 8th of November. At the time, that was, stock was trading a little bit shy of 15, 1491. And it's kind of vacillated in this range of about, uh, you know, high 13s to flirting with 15, not quite breaking through. Got into the mid 13s a little bit a while ago there. Actually recently hit 1298 back on the 24th. So it had a little bit of downside there before popping again on the 26th to uh, 1374. And apparently that was enough for this guy. He decided, you know what, I I haven't been on the right side of this trade. The stock has pretty much vacillated or gone down ever since I put this trade on. I bought myself until March. But you know, if you're long premium trader listeners, you got to have that stuff happen fairly soon before too much decay sets in. And then you kind of just make him back decay. So our friend here decided, I think that pop... From about 1298 up to 1374 on the 26th, our friend here decided, you know what? Discretion is indeed the better part of the valor. I'm saving what I have left on this trade. We saw about actually 15,000 of these things. Actually, he had increased his OI since our trade. But uh, he had 15,000 traded on the 26th, and he wiped out pretty much all of the OI. <laughs> nothing, nothing really left going on. They were trading at the time. The stock ended up closing around 13 and three quarters. And these things closed for around a buck oh seven. So he took them off around a buck and change, having lost somewhere around seventy cents on this trade. Mark, you're a, you're a, a fund manager out there. You could certainly maybe empathize with this guy a little bit and uh, say, hey, you know, sometimes when the trade's not going your way, you got. We've talked before about when trade goes your way, you got to take it off. Sometimes if it's not going your way, you got to take these bad boys off as well. What do you think about this guy here? putting on some upside, or not not even that much upside, kind of at the money, and then having it not go his way and deciding a few months later uh, to get the heck out of Dodge, sir. You know, there's nothing wrong with uh, cutting losers. Um, I wish people did that more often, but uh, a lot of people don't. Uh, and it's very easy to become uh, guilty of that, that crime. But, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe this was against a stock position where – the guy made money anyway, and it didn't matter because, um, remember, the, a lot of times these have complex pieces to them, right? So for all we know, the guy's super happy because he made a lot of money trading this. Yes, let's all take the optimistic viewpoint that uh, this guy just printed money and only the options leg lost. But, again, that's all we see here. And uh, looking at it purely from that perspective, uh, it, it, the option side at least. Did not work out to his favor. Let's see if our second friend feared any better. Uh, we're going to go back to October 29th now for this one. This is easy to say. Excelixis Inc. It sounds like a pharma name, and it is indeed a genomics-based drug discovery company. So you know, right off the bat, they're probably going to have some movement, some volatility baked into them. And what we profile at the time, ticker symbol, by the way, Excel, E-X-E-L, not, not the spreadsheet. I think Microsoft may have something to say about that, but no. Uh, Excel, E-X-E-L, trading today about 22 bucks, up about a buck and a quarter. So a good day for them, up, up nearly 6%. Uh, at the time when we profiled this, which was back, uh, what was this, October 29th, they were trading 13.65. So they're a wee bit away from where they are right now to the tune of oh, around eight handles or so. Uh, let's see. And, uh, yeah, this one, another one, they have, we saw some call love back then. We saw the Feb 16 calls going up 10,000 times for a buck 35. This one was kind of, uh, again, first off, Excel, not a hot name. So the market was, shall we say, a wee bit wide 
They were sixty cents at a buck thirty-five. Uh, it had the feel. It was definitely opening. There was no OI on the strike. It had the feel we thought at the time. It looked like paper was probably buying these, but again, was such a huge. The goalpost being so wide there and coming in kind of in the middle, your 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 interpretation uh, it could be valid there as well. Interesting stuff. If they did buy these, it, it would be weird that they because they are indeed still open. This one has been kind of a home run. The stock today, like I said. It was over t- about $22. It hit, it hit $22.01 a little bit earlier today. So these things have moved substantially uh, since then. Yet coming into today, at least, these bad boys were still open. Oh, it was about 20000 open on this strike here. So it uh, looks like our friend here, if he did buy them, uh, he hit a bit of a home run. Uh, so it maybe it makes you think maybe he did indeed sell these bad boys. And in which case, uh, he's just... Uh, he's just He's just dumping his stock at that point, and he's kind of washed his hands of it. Uh, either way, it's been kind of interesting uh, here to watch. We saw the 29th. We saw that's, there's 20,000 open because our friend did 10,000 on the 29th, and he did 10,000 more the next day. So he decided to double down here as well. A lot of double downing going on in our odd block lately. Uh, he did the first kind for around, what was it, buck 35. The second day, they went around, around a buck and a quarter. He did some more around that level when the stock was a little bit north of 14 bucks there. Uh, so, yeah, these things are still open, all 20000 which is kind of intriguing. So if he bought these, uh, then he's got to snap to it. He's got to do something with these because they go away in February, and they are pretty meaty on the bone. These calls, oh, whopping 6 bucks in the money <laughs> as we speak. So if you bought them, it worked out pretty well. Mr. Meatball, does that make you think maybe he sold these bad boys and he's just, uh, he's just, he's just letting his stock go at this point? That would be my best bet. Uh, you know, uh, that would really be the only reason to to do uh, to do that, right? That would be the most charitable interpretation. Of that. Otherwise, and this guy just forgot he put this super home run winning trade on, and in which case, someone should maybe tap him on the shoulder and say, "Hey, you need to uh, you need to do some stuff." To quote your friend there, the Rock Lobster. All right, let's wrap it up here with our third. Victim of the day here. What do we got? We got Cornerstone On Demand Inc. My favorite ticker symbol CSOD, the cloud based learning and talent management solutions provider. Whatever the heck that means. I guess you can learn and also maybe do HR on their platform. I don't know. Either way, uh, this one we profiled back on November 8th of last year as well. Ticker symbol CSOD trading today $51. And sixty four cents up about a buck thirty two or about two two and a half percent or so. What we profiled back then looked like also some call love. It was the Feb sixty two halves going up for a buck twenty about three thousand times close to it. Uh, excuse me, they came in right off the offer. These things were eighty cents at a buck thirty five. They printed there about three thousand twenty eight hundred or so for about a buck twenty, so close to the offer opening. Not a lot of paper in this name. Another one where they kind of doubled down. They worth they they added more on November 9th to the tune of another fifteen hundred, so putting the OI up to about forty five hundred or so. Uh, weirdly enough, we did see a big block trade of about five thousand, so almost exactly the OI, a little bit of more uh, on the tenth as well when the stock was about. 50, right about where it is right now, 51 and change. And these things were trading for 65 cents. And yet uh, the OI remained unched, which is kind of interesting. It would have seemed like someone maybe was uh, coming in to get the heck out of Dodge, but not the case. Currently, we have still, these things are mostly still open. There's about 4,000 open on this strike, which makes it kind of weird. Let's look back here on the 8th. At the time of the 8th, this stock was trading. Uh, 51 and a half, so almost exactly unched from where it is right now. In the interim, it dropped down to about 47 and a half and got as high as about 54 and a half. So it, it had a nice little range of about, about seven handles or so there, uh, kind of in the middle to the lower portion of that range right now. And our friend here, I guess, despite all this vacillation, not, not taking these bad boys off, even though he had some opportunities uh, in between. And other than that, these things have kind of been, uh, a little bit quiet, another 1,000 traded on the 11th for around 70 cents. So maybe he took some of those off then because the OI dropped a little bit. But, yeah, it's been weird paper. For the most part, Mark, another story of someone coming in, opening up calls. Uh, they have some moments to take them off, at least to salvage some of what they put on here. 
and yet not really taking them. What, what's your thoughts here on yet again? Uh, it looks like not uh, not taking off what you put on, sir. Isn't that annoying? You always, you, you know, you need to take off what you uh, when you make money on something. Take your money and run. And it always bugs me when people don't do that. So here's hoping this guy will change his ways and uh, and everything will be great. <laughs> you know, it, it is it's kind of become a theme for the odd block a lot lately. You've seen these size prints go up that seemingly work out, or in this case, at least he has a chance to maybe mitigate some of the erosion, and yet they don't take it, uh, which is in, often they'll double down too. They'll see them doubling down to do more the day after the trade, and then they don't take it off. So yeah, there's a lot of a lot of weirdness, a lot of mystery. Here in the odd block, these are head scratches. We'll keep these on. We'll keep them in our to watch list until they go out, listeners. Maybe something else will unfold with them that will make the mystery more sensible. But for now, at least, uh, there's all sorts of crazy going on. We're going to keep an eye on it. That's what we do here on the show. Speaking of crazy, let's see what Uncle Mike's got for his second strategy block. You like some of his strategy blocks. Actually, you like his birthday strategy block. So maybe this one will, will also appeal to your uh, inner lovers of strategy because it's time for the strategy block. It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for The Strategy Block. All right, Uncle Mike, the listeners have spoken. They liked your birthday strategy block, so I don't know. I don't remember what you talked about on that one, but talk about it again because they liked it. (laughs) Roy talked about it on on that one either, quite honestly, but nonetheless, I'll go through it. Uh, and do what I can do. So to allude to what I talked about a little bit earlier today, I wanted to go through uh, dipping a toe in the water and what's the first step in terms of how I'm doing that. Well, what I did about a year and a half ago when I wanted to just kind of dip my toe in the water a little bit is I went through and I actually bought some cheap out-of-the-money calls on SPY. So what are some things that I would be looking to do at this stage for uh, dipping the toe in the water, doing things a Along those lines and uh, buying an out of the money call really doesn't uh, give me, I'm not very motivated to do such a thing at this point and just an out of the money call only. And the reason is, is that, well, volatility is too high for my taste fast enough. Then the out of the money calls will leave you to the old adage out of money. And so when doing so uh, you need to be very careful with it. And one of the reasons that I was so happy and excited about the out of money calls year was because, well, they were very cheap in my opinion. It worked out pretty well. However, this year things are a little bit different. So what I'm looking to do this week, maybe may or may not be today. Usually I like to look at my trades closer to the close of the trading. But what I'm looking at this week is I want to look to either buy an out-of-the-money butterfly or an out-of-the-money call spread or lesser position. And I want to stay vertical at this point. And the reason for that is that I don't want a lot of deltas on the table right now. Uh, for reasons with which I described earlier in the trading block. And by do, doing something along the lines of, say, a butterfly or a call spread, uh, you have the ability to take on a smaller amount of risk, but still have it set to where you could make a lot of money if the market shoots up uh, back to levels of which it was just a couple months ago. The thing that I would also emphasize on this is that I'm not, I repeat, I am not looking to be horizontal or diagonal in this marketplace. Reason for that is that I believe that volatility is higher right now. And if the market does go higher, which I believe it will over the course of the next year, but I always believe that, so there's nothing new there. But as that happens, if it happens, I believe that volatility will go lower. So let's say, for example, that I were to buy an out-of-the-money calendar spread, whether it's six months to one month, uh, one week to three weeks, or whatever time frame you want to use. If you're doing something that's bullish along those lines, then as the market goes higher, volatility goes lower. And you're locking in longer-term implied volatility that's going to go down, and you're selling shorter-term implied volatility that's going to go away. So when it's time to sell volatility for the following of it because of the fact that vol is lower, if indeed that happens. Now, with that being said, I want to emphasize that you need to take the right steps in terms of managing your risk. Don't put on too big of a position. Uh, make sure that it matches with your overall uh, financial goals and uh, objectives. But with all that being said, the bottom line of what I'm looking to do with this, you need to stay vertical if you are looking to do some type of bullish exposure to this market with call options. 
I think that makes more sense. Now, the other side of this is that with volatility this high, would I consider selling a put spread? And the answer is yes, I am going to look at that. However, if I do, it is going to be a much lesser position, and it's something to where you know, I want to know that it's going to be um, – I'll have the ability to make an adjustment should the market go lower quickly. I'm going to be very careful on that side of it. So those are the two things that I'm looking to do. But the bottom line of what I really want to emphasize today on the strategy block is stay vertical. There you go. Stay vertical, listeners, in this market for – Mostly crazy people right now, as Uncle Mike has alluded to. Speaking of crazies, let's get to some of you crazies, see what you got on your collective brains. I got a feeling Apple is one of them, so we'll talk about that as a bunch of other stuff as we get on into the mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for the mail block. All right, everybody, let's get to it. Let's kick things off. Let's actually pay off a couple of the questions we asked you guys before. We talked about this on Vol Views, but if you missed that one, uh, the, I know there's different, different audiences enjoy these programs as, as those numbers show. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, we asked you guys where you thought we did our big crystal ball palooza. You guys, a ton of you weighed in. We, we're still collating all your results. But we'll have all of them ready, of course, for its end-of-the-year contest anyway, so no rush there. But that closet, that contest, I should say, or the closet, but that contest did close. and went into the closet on the end of Friday there. So hopefully you got your votes in. In terms of the broad poll, we asked you, where do you think VIX is going to close? We gave you some broad ranges to, to pick close for the end of the year, of course. Uh, 37% coming out on top with the very elevated zone of North 23 32% hot on its heels saying elevated, 17 to 23%. So about pretty much well, more than two-thirds of you guys saying it's going to be somewhere north of 17 by the end of the year. About 30% of you, 29% actually, saying you're going to be in that relatively normal range of around 12 to about 17. And only 2% biting on the back to 2017 levels of 8 to about 12 on the downside. This week we're asking you... A little bit different question. One of your favorite names to trade, as again pointed out by today's most actives, yet again, Apple top in the charts, despite the fact that it's kind of not doing a lot today. Uh, we asked you guys, you know, Apple had been moving. It was shy of the 150 handle coming in to right now. I just had the quote up. Let's pull it up. It is still, I believe, below that level. There we go. Yes, it is. It is off now a little bit, off one and a quarter handle. So feeling a little bit of the downside today. Apparently, that Samsung news not enough to lift Apple. Trading 147 right now, pretty much. So, yes, those puts, the 150 puts we highlighted in our poll a few weeks ago, still firmly in the money, around three bucks right now. At the time you posted this, they were about two bucks in the money. And so we asked you, what do you guys want to do now? The puts are in the money. Do you want to keep them and buy the stock at around 148? Do you want to wheel out, as Uncle Mike and his ilk like to do all the time, maybe with a covered call, so you don't really want to have a lot of upside exposure to Apple? Uh, you want to roll that put down, or do you want to close out the position entirely? And guys, it's been fascinating to watch this. As more and more people come in to vote, uh, the, <laughs> the breakdown gets more and more even, it seems like. People are, are split across the board on this one. In fact, it looks like a little bit of a surge just came into the puts, so they're there, it was almost 25% across the board when the show started. Now it's about 29%. By the way, this goes on for another day or two, listeners. So if you haven't made your voice heard yet, head on over to Ad Options. Get your voice heard out there. Right now, the puts, selling the, excuse me, happily keeping the stock, buying the puts, buying the stock at 148, I should say, around 29%. So just ever so slightly edging it out. Number two is rolling the put down, which is kind of interesting. 26% want to do that. 24% saying you want to just get the heck out of Dodge and close the position, take your hit on the puts. Not exactly sounding too bullish on Apple right now. If that's your case. And then number one, or should, be, should I say number four, is wheeling out with the old covered call. Uncle Mike, you're a resident Apple guy. Uh, do, you, do you have any thoughts on the where you, where you fall on this poll, A? And B, do these kind of even results surprise you? Oh, a little bit. I mean, I, I'm i sticking to what I want and that um, buying it at this level, um, I don't, we're not taking any greater positions at this point, but this level, it's not a bad, bad spot to be. So I'm sitting on it and just letting it get put to me. Mr. Meatball, I know in the past you had said you'd be leery if it got south of 150, but then you started liking these levels and we're talking about selling some put spreads. Is that still what you're up to out there, sir? I did. I didn't want to talk through the back of Mike's amazing uh, uh, strategy blocks. So I uh, responsibly muted myself, but uh, irresponsibly did, forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> um, but I, I'll tell you, yeah, I like. I don't. 
I like Apple here. I, I think that um, put sales make a lot of sense. Um, I, I think that there are a lot of decent areas where one can set up a put sale in Apple and be relatively happy. Uh, near dated and longer dated. Um, I mean, since since Friday, since like Thursday when this thing really went nuts, um, July and you know longer dated options are in pretty considerably. Uh, and so it just shows you that there's a lot of smart money going in and selling longer dated premium. So I like that as a, uh, a strategy here. Uh, I mean, when I was looking and on Thursday, right around here, the July uh, 145 puts were getting you, oh, like 14 bucks. And now they're um, uh, about 11 and a half. That's, uh, that's a nice little uh, vol drop. Yeah, people are taking an opportunity to harvest the old risk premium, as uh, everyone likes to say these days, the oft-used phrase. But doing so aggressively, it seems like, out there in Apple land. So if, you're, if you were inclined, hopefully you got in on that train and you've, you've collected some of that premium yourself. Uh, Sunset Superman, I like that handle, chiming in saying he thinks it's a pick-your-poison thing on this, just manage any more risk. Okay, I guess I agree with that. That's kind of a uh, a non statement statement, but we'll allow it. Olive Trader two uh, regular listener says he wants. He said just take your losses, close out the puts. I can see that. You know, the experienced trader saying maybe something is structurally wrong here with this name. I want to get the heck out of Dodge and maybe reevaluate. That's certainly not a not a nonsensible position. A senior says he sold his puts and will wait to buy more when Apple recovers a little bit. Uh, maybe I think he means he sold his stock. He sold his stock and will wait to buy more. When Apple recovers a little bit here. Interesting. All right. Well, all, people are all across the board as, as evidenced by our poll results. You got another day and or so to get out there at options. Make your voice heard, listeners. Yeah, it's surprising how evenly split. People usually have, have a bias in one way or the other. Maybe two things are fighting it out. In this case, it's pretty much evenly split, roughly 25% to each. So that is interesting in and of itself. A, not, no, by no means a unanimous opinion. On Apple right now. All right, let's go over here. What you guys got in store for us? Paul, Paul Vasquez. He wants to know, when is the official, in quotes, when is the official close as far as options expiration is concerned? I've had calls assigned and had stocks put to me when the strike was out of the money at market close, but it moved in and out after, during after hours trading. Any light you can shed on how options expirations work would be appreciated. Thanks, Paul. It's coming in from scenic and sunny Sacramento. Uh, lovely, lovely part of the country these days in particular. Uh, yeah, you know, Paul, it's funny how that works, isn't it? Uh, yeah, but you do have that window after hours. And, if, you know, people, a lot of particularly the retail come to it and they assume, particularly on expiration, on expiration when the close comes in, that's it. Your options are obviously automatically exercised or assigned if they're a penny in the money. And that's kind of the end of the dance, but it's not. And the professionals know and we used to see this all the time when we were on the floor waiting. Sometimes earnings announcements would come out after hours. Or other things would come out after. I remember back when I was in Intel, we'd have other big names like Microsoft popping off after the bell and expiration. So we would obviously wait to give in our exercise. You have those hours afterwards, and it depends on your broker you to reach out to them and see how, what the process is for doing it. But you do have this option, pun intended, a few hours after the close there to give contrary instructions. Maybe if you have options that are in the money, and for whatever reason you don't want them to be exercised, you can do that. Or the flip side, you know, if you have options that are maybe out of the money and you look and you see that the stock is moving, maybe there's a big announcement after the hour or something like that, you can exercise calls that otherwise at the close would have been worthless, maybe, let's say, or put the same thing, uh, and say, hey, you know, the stock's actually up 10% in the after hours for some crazy news. Maybe I want to use these calls as well, or these puts, whatever you have in stock here. And, and exercise those depending on where the stock's moving and take advantage of that. So that's kind of a, it's a thing you don't hear about as much anymore. It used to be very common when exercise and expiration was a lot more hands-on. You had to be, now it's all so automatic. People just forget about it. But you do have that window after the close. That's also something as you're learning here, if you're short premium, you need to be aware of that obviously as well because strikes that you thought were worthless are now could sometimes be coming in to bite you. Another reason why 
you should close this stuff out around expiration, particularly if your broker doesn't charge you for that, because all you have is risk. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you come in with some position in the underlying that you weren't anticipating. And I'm guessing if someone's doing that against you, it's probably not going to be in your favor. So it's something to be, uh, to be aware of. I don't know, Mike or Mark, I'll let either of you, I'll open it up to either of you. We want to weigh in on the, the quote-unquote official close for options after expiration, sirs. Yeah, I think that the, yeah. you have until yeah, five was, Eastern time to to turn in your um, to turn in your exercises. Might be five thirty, uh, and that's where those contrary exercises can happen, and um, that's a uh, a big deal. Uh, so you know, after the bell, those there are sometimes that stocks move on Fridays after the close, and you have to be careful. Uh, that uh, you're at, or on Mondays and Wednesdays now, and you have to be careful that the contrary exercise, you, you know, that there wasn't a crazy move on something you're short. That's why, you know, it's one thing to kind of go out long some options, but if you're short an at the money option or a near the, or a near out of the money option, and you don't close it for the penny, you are playing with fire, and from a risk management perspective, it's completely not worth it. Uncle Mike, you ever do any contrary orders after the close or have these things come back to uh, impact some of your positions? Well, here's what I'd like to tell everyone to do. I'd encourage you with the penny options, just let them expire worthless. And here's why. Because I like to let my penny options that are uh, long just sit there. And then all of a sudden, if uh, the market goes way up, I get a pleasant surprise the next day. Uh, So if I'm long, so I'm just saying that facetiously, get out of them. Um, I think that like Mark said, you're playing with fire. Uh, I remember when I worked at Options Express on um, expiration day, back when it was all on, they used to buy everybody seven lunch because the fact that in case something happened, they needed to call all hands on deck uh, to deal with closeouts. And what closeouts are is that the broker will do every, and this is pretty much any broker, they'll do anything that they can to not have you go into expiration without the risk. They don't want that just because uh, it's a hassle to them, and it's very dangerous to you, the trader. Uh, I remember our, our risk manager, he used to give us a new Rockney speech every Friday, and I wasn't even in the trading department or the risk department. I was just there to help out every Friday that I was in town, and um, it was very much, I'll, I'll never forget how he would present with, and if Google is $10 out of the money, it's in the money today. And it was one to where it was pretty dramatic, and um, you don't want to be anywhere near uh being assigned or to be exercise or to exercise automatically because the other thing if you're long an option and it's maybe slightly out of the money uh if all of a sudden it becomes in the money if it's in the money by a penny or more then by rules of the occ you're going to be it's going to be exercised automatically so keep that in mind when you're going through this and that uh, if you're close get out it is not worth it uh the only other thing i'd want to add now i think about if you are long an option and maybe it's a little bit out of the money and it would be too much of a commission to close it, then what you can do is you can call your broker and just give them a do not exercise order. So with that, get out. That's the bottom line. Um, well, and really, your- here's the other thing I would say is if you, if your decision to close an option is determined by your commission, then you're paying way too much in commission. Yeah, you know, people always have that psychological barrier, right? If, uh, if the commission's worth more than the position, they just won't do it. It's a weird psychological tick a lot of people have, even if it's a couple of bucks, right? Uh, oh, I'm not going to pay money to close that. I, I, how many times have I heard that? So, yeah, there's that weird. That's why I like brokers. Well, here an example, though. Real quick, though, Mark, an example sure. of that is let's say even if you have a really good commission rate, and let's say the option's out of the money, and it's trading at zero cents by a dollar and you're long the option or zero cents by a penny i'm sorry and you're long the option at zero bid and you can't close it out that would be another example yes that is an excellent example michael that really is good job but in terms of what you said if you do have to think about the cost of it then you are paying too much for commissions i would agree with you on that one no doubt and if you're trading options that are no bid at a dollar then uh you got some crazy options going on in your portfolio you do (laughs) you got some high high vol position so yeah long long short answer to your question here paul it's a good question by the way we i don't we i don't know if we've ever really touched on that before no one's ever really asked us uh so yeah yeah you have that couple hour window after the close it's funny another thing too i think that people 
have become so near to expiration now because it happens almost literally every day. Oh, it's another expiration. They'll forget about it. When it was once a month, it was a bigger deal. People made a lot more, you know, there's a lot more show and pageantry and effort that went into it. Now it's like, oh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, whatever. You know, not a big deal. So, yeah, it's kind of fallen by the wayside a little bit, that, that little secret, quote-unquote, window. Your brokers don't really go out there and advertise it to you, and you got to do the extra homework to actually reach out to do it. It's not usually a button on the website. You probably have to call them, which I know you want to do. But that's, that's what it is there, Paul. So keep an eye on that. If you're a premium seller, make sure you got stuff out of the money and you're being lazy or being cheap. You don't want to close it. Those can come back to bite you. So watch your stuff in the, that couple-hour window after the close. See what's going on. Watch the after hours because... That you could have a surprise otherwise waiting for you uh, in your account on Monday morning. All right, let's keep on rolling into our final segment. It is time to go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody, welcome to Around the Block, the portion of the show where we do just that. We go around the option block and tell you what we're watching for the rest of this week, at least until we gather here together on Thursday to talk some more option block here. Uh, Let's go back. Let's go the opposite way again. Let's go back to the meatball. Mr. Meatball, we're in kind of this weird kind of nether region right now. (laughs) Nether realm maybe might be better. (laughs) Nether region has other connotations. Uh, But, you know, we're in this weird zone in the market right now where, you know, one day we're up strong, next day we're down strong. Today we're in the we're in the former portion of that category. You never know when the ladder may rear its ugly head again. It could be another tweet coming out of the administration. It could be some other element for development from the market or the government shutdown that exacerbates issues, the trade war, a lot of things lurking out there, other shoes waiting to drop. So what are you keeping an eye on in these kind of crazy times in the market, sir? You know, I'm just kind of really watching how vol- the volatility space is moving. I'm watching interest rates. I'm watching uh, really – just uh just a lot of different little little stuff uh i i I don't think we've got a lot of big announcements coming up uh that are overly concerning uh so yeah i'm just not uh i'm not sure i i there's anything specific other than you know are we going to make that that run at the 50-day moving average uh in the spx and now that we're the VIX curve is really flat. Uh, what's the next move? Uh, so if I'm, I guess if, I, if I'm watching anything, it's the VIX curve. Yeah, I was just pulling that up as you were talking to see if our flatness is still intact. And it is. It is. We are still eerily flat, I think we termed it on, on which is a kind of a weird scenario. That's also maybe the VIX showing us, you know, we don't know where the hell we're going in the, in the next couple of weeks. Longer term, things get a little bit more sensible, as usual. But in the near term, it's it's a bit of a coin flip out there. What the heck's going to happen? Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, same question for you. You sound like you're cautiously getting dipping some toes back in at these levels, but you still give the caveat that it's a market for, shall we say, if not crazy people, at least mildly perturbed people. <laughs> what uh, what are you watching for the rest of this week until Thursday, sir? If you were still that ill, I would have told well, you. Well, I think 250 and, and SPY oh, is something man. I'm really looking at really closely. I think uh, in when uh, – we have if we not dip like, below that like level, and uh, if we go above that level, if we stay above that level, then we're positive on the year for the most part. SPY didn't close 2018 right at 250, but it was very close to it. So I'm watching that because I think it's a key number. Uh, also, uh, very close to the open. I'm sorry, the close of last year. So looking at that, and of course, looking at things macro, I think that all of a sudden. We get a deal if there's a wall and uh, people agree on stuff and everybody's happy. I think the market's going to like that because it'll display more certainty, not because they're um, concerned about uh, political issues either by the aisle quite. But I think that if we see more uh, stability and less government interference, then I think that'll be viewed as a positive for the market. So watching that, uh, as well as things that are going on in China. All right, listeners, unfortunately, that means we've come to the end of the party here on the old option block. And what a party it was. We talked about what was lighting it up in our tapes. Kind of a weird day for everybody. Names that are making it up. Names that you can then shows that you guys love and like to continue to download what you like. You like Uncle Mike's strategy block. Uh, you like the Rock Lobster talking about Asian options or perhaps not so much there. Uh, you like the meatball doing all of his various crazy things here on the network so we'll try to keep delivering to you what you guys like hopefully you checked out just 
we did it live on Friday, but just launched hit the network this morning, actually late last night, uh, our new crypto show, the Crypto Rundown. So if you're intrigued, I know you guys have been hitting us up all, all year long. What would crypto options look like if they were listed? What would the skew look like? What's the volatility? We answer all those questions and a lot more because, spoiler alert, they are trading. They're just not listed. So we got some good folks on there to help us break down things like the skew. So if you want to know what it's been like throughout the course of a very wild year in crypto, check it out. It's hitting the network pretty much as we speak. It's been a while since we had a new show hitting the network, so that's always really fun. That should going to be coming at you. We did it on Friday this past week. I think we're going to move it to Mondays. That's better for people's schedules. So look forward to it next week, next Monday, from pretty much a week from now. A new episode of that hitting the network pretty soon. A lot of great guests lined up for that. Should be a fun one. So if you're even remotely intrigued by crypto and even with the sell-off, a lot of you guys are, I know. Check it out. It's a fun one. Let's go back around the horn and see what's cooking. Let's start with uh, the meatball. Mr. Meatball, again, I've heard the rumor that the uh, the one-eyed lobster himself is coming to town this week. Uh, what do you got cooking for people who might be in Chicago tomorrow, sir? Yeah, uh, on Thursday. Yeah, we're doing oh, it's an Thursday. event. Okay. On, we're doing an event at the SIBO from 4:30 to uh, 6:30. It'll be us presenting on uh, volatility and some some uh, new fun stuff that we've been working on with drinks afterwards. So, if you like free drinks and hanging out with me and Andrew, uh, and you're going to be in the Chicago area, uh, come and visit us. Uh, and uh, you can uh, I've, I'll, I've tweeted out uh, where you can register and uh, uh, hope I think Mark may make an appearance as well he likes getting drinks on me so it would make sense that that would be something he would show up for the best drinks and the best food on the planet are always the ones that are on the, on the courtesy of Mr. Mr. Meatball as long as the SIBO security doesn't tackle me at the door uh, I shall endeavor sir to make an appearance <laughs> Uh, you know, <laughs> it should be fun. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, what is cooking for you over there in St. Charles Wealth Management? Well, stay tuned to the website. We will be having some in-person events in the near future. But in the meantime, if you are looking for a financial advisor uh, who is not uh, uh, going to uh, just cower down and say, well, uh, we just got to do nothing right now, uh, please call me. Uh, feel free to visit my website for more information or shoot me an email at mtosaw at stcharleswealth.com. There you go, listeners. Hit the man up. Click on the fox. Someday it'll do something cool if I keep saying that. So head on over to stcharleswealth.com. Click on the fox and have all the fun. Hopefully have all the fun listening to our shows. We'll be back with more good stuff. we got some more interviews coming for you this week. we got all of our usual array of shows coming at you live and on demand. So check them out. And we'll see you back here on Thursday for more of the Option Block.